Welcome to the Improve 81 podcast. I'm Ken Slack, Interstate 81 Communications Coordinator for the Virginia Department of Transportation. Now, in previous episodes, we have talked about a wide variety of road projects and operational enhancements, but the I-81 Corridor Improvement Program also includes some multimodal components, and that will be our focus today. Joining me is Jennifer Mitchell, Director of the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation, as well as Dave Covington, I-81 Program Delivery Director for VDOT. The I-81 CIP is not just about pavement and bridges. It's a multifaceted effort to enhance safety, reduce congestion, and provide for enhanced economic development. Now, Dave, tell me how multimodal projects uh, can contribute to that effort. Well, we've talked a lot, as you mentioned, about um, capital improvement projects and operational projects, but the multimodal projects really is what makes this a system. Um, and these solutions are a true system for Interstate 81. They, they work together to contribute to the overall goal of the program, which is enhancing safety, reducing congestion, and providing opportunity for economic development. So the multimodal component really offers travelers choices. And so that you know, some of those choices will ultimately lead to fewer vehicles on the road, which in turn enhances safety and reduces congestion. So Jennifer, maybe a good place to start is sort of an overview. What are some of these multimodal projects that we can expect to see? Sure. So um, as part of the 81 plan, we will be uh, increasing passenger rail service and also inner city bus service in the 81 corridor. And yes, it really is designed to increase person throughput and reduce congestion. Um, We'll be expanding uh, service with a second uh, round trip to Roanoke every day and then also expanding inner city uh, passenger rail service to the New River Valley with a new station in Christiansburg. We expect that we'll have uh, over 220,000 passenger trips due to the new second Roanoke train and also another 38,000 for the New River Valley extension. As part of that, we'll also be expanding inner city bus service in the 81 corridor too. Now let's take these uh, maybe one component at a time. Uh, You mentioned inner city bus service, uh, transit service, uh, and a good example of that is the Virginia Breeze. Can you tell us some some of the details about that service and uh, and how it's serving folks along the I-81 corridor? Sure. So inner city bus service is really designed to connect rural communities to um, our urban areas and also to areas where they can access other forms of transportation. In Virginia, we already have a very successful Virginia Breeze service that provides service along the 81 corridor. Uh, We have the Valley Flyer service, which originates in Blacksburg. We also have just initiated two other new routes, the Piedmont Express, which originates in Danville and also goes up to D.C., and the Capital Connector, which originates in Martinsville and connects to Richmond and D.C. as well. So we expect to have a new route the originating from Bristol called the Highlands Rhythm. And again, it will really connect some of our rural communities uh, to other parts of the Commonwealth and beyond. You'll be able to access Dulles Airport, Union Station. Uh, from Union Station, you can take a megabus or other Amtrak trains up into the Northeast Corridor. And it's a much more convenient and predictable service uh, to connect people to their friends and families. So the, the Bristol extension, uh, that literally gives us uh, just almost all of the I-81 corridor through Virginia. Now, does that tie in with the Virginia Breeze? It will be. It'll be a whole new route that will be part of the Virginia Breeze service. Um, We're very excited to be expanding that. We expect to have up to 25,000 riders a year on that service. It's going to be a daily northbound and southbound service connecting Bristol to Union Station. It's going to have stops in the 81 corridor uh, in Withville, Christiansburg, Salem, Roanoke, Harrisonburg, Dulles Airport, and the West Falls Church Metro Rail Station. Uh, That service is going to be supported with the 81 corridor funds. We're in the process of procuring a contractor, and we expect ticket sales to begin uh, later this fall. Now, for folks who have never taken this type of transit, Virginia Breeze, for example, that's already in place along the corridor, there's some amenities there that might surprise them. Yeah, it's a very comfortable service. It's got very comfortable seats. It's got uh, Wi-Fi service in many routes, bathrooms, and (laughs) provides a very comfortable one-seat ride to some of your favorite destinations. Excellent. Well, Dave, um, one of the goals of uh, multimodal improvements is to take some passenger and freight traffic off the roadways. So how does that affect VDOT's plan for interstate projects? 
Well, there are imp implications that will directly affect the interstate system. And in some cases, some of the projects that we're delivering specifically are capital projects. Uh, and as we look forward to some of these capital projects in the future, you know, changes in travel patterns will affect what types of projects we deliver, how we deliver them. Um, you know, we may not have a, a widening project. We may change it into something else like an auxiliary lane project. So it can certainly have a lot of, of, of impact on, on how we deliver the program over time um, because the program, you know, is perpetual in nature at this point. So I think we will see a shift at some point. One of the interesting things, we, we do have a truck parking task force that we formed to try to solve the problem that was identified in the I-81 corridor study, which was a deficiency of 950 truck parking spaces along the corridor. That's based on current traffic, not future traffic. So, I mean, that that's going to continue to grow as more and more trucks are, are on the interstate system. And it's a really challenging issue because it's not only a public issue, but a private issue as well. So public meaning we're looking for opportunities to expand safe, reliable and available truck parking at, for instance, some of our safety rest areas or other VDOT owned facilities. But that's not going to solve the problem. It, it really needs to be a joint effort you know, between what we're doing in the, the public sector and what the private sector is doing with some of the private travel plazas. So 950 um, doesn't seem like a big number, but where are the opportunities for those increases? So any uh, opportunity that, that we have to move, for instance, freight from truck to rail uh, is a real bonus for us because it helps us solve a really challenging problem right now because, you know, we can't have direct influence over what you know, private entities do, um, but we're going to do the best that we can within our own right of way and then try to work with local governments to, you know, make some of these travel plazas a little bit more enticing for the localities. Um, but again, it's a systematic approach. You know, we're, we're solving it through uh, enhancing truck parking. And then hopefully we're solving it also by getting some, some of the freight from the truck to rail so that, you know, we can come at it from a few different angles. Yeah, and Dave brings up a really important point about the importance of freight rail to the 81 corridor, too. We do need to move trucks off the road. Uh, we have actually been investing in freight transportation in this corridor since 2006. We have our Rail Enhancement Fund program. We've funded over $70 million of new mainline improvements, tunnel clearances, and new sidings in this corridor. We also have our Rail Industrial Access Fund that's provided $12 million of funds over the last 15 years. These are projects that connect industrial sites and manufacturers directly to the rail network. It builds rail spurs and then it helps move more freight transportation that would have otherwise been moving by truck onto rail instead. So sort of an all of the above approach. And one of those possibilities so we're looking at potential solutions uh, is the the Western Rail Initiative. It includes an enhancement to existing passenger service uh, and uh, an expansion, as you, you touched on a moment ago, Jennifer. So can you give us a little more detail about what this initiative uh, will bring to pass? Sure. So the Western Rail Initiative is a key part of our Transforming Rail in Virginia program. Uh, it's really a game-changing uh, paradigm shift where the Commonwealth will now own some of our own tracks. Uh, we're partnering with rail operators on this as well. Uh, a key component of this is expanding the Long Bridge, which is a br rail bridge between Virginia and D.C., which today carries all of our passenger rail uh, trains as well as CSX freight trains uh, across the bridge. And it is one of the biggest rail bottlenecks on the entire East Coast. So that is a key component of our Transforming Rail in Virginia initiative. That bridge expansion is allowing us as well to expand passenger rail service uh, to Roanoke and the New River Valley. Uh, so as part of the Western Rail Initiative, we're acquiring a, a line called the Virginian Line. It's 28.5 miles of track that's currently owned by Norfolk Southern. Uh, we'll be acquiring that, for, and it will have um, tracks from Salem to Christiansburg. We'll be building a new station in Christiansburg. We're currently looking at a range of potential station locations for that. In addition to that, we'll be expanding uh, and improving infrastructure between 
Roanoke, Lynchburg, and Manassas as well. That'll provide some more capacity and improve uh, the reliability of service um, that we have there too. So very ex- excited about the second train to Roanoke. Uh, we expect to begin that in the spring of 2022 uh, once we um, are able to reinstate some of our Amtrak service that was stalled with um, COVID. So looking forward to having that start this spring. And we expect the extension to the new River Valley to happen by 2025. Now, this uh, requires some partnerships. You mentioned the Long Bridge. That's a whole lot of partners involved in that, I imagine, as well as some private operators that uh, the DRPT works with. Uh, can tell us about some of these partnerships between Commonwealth and particularly in private sector. Sure. These these partnerships are so important because we've really got to have a win-win in any uh, deals that we have with our freight partners. And uh, freight rail is important to us as well. As Dave mentioned, it's important for us to take trucks off the road to reduce congestion. So we want our freight partners, such as Norfolk Southern and CSX, to be successful in moving freight throughout the state too. Uh, today, we partner with them on expanding across the state. In the future, we will be acquiring infrastructure from them and still having them dispatch service for us. So they'll be actually operating the trains, but we will actually own the track and be able to separate our passenger trains from their freight service. It's a big shift from the way things are done today. Again, though, it's going to be a very um, important partnership. On the Long Bridge that I mentioned, we're also partnering with Amtrak and Virginia Railway Express, which is our commuter rail operator in Virginia. They're both providing funding towards that. Amtrak's providing $944 million, and VRE is providing about $220 million. So we appreciate the partnerships that we have with our operators across the state, too. Now, Dave, some of these multimodal improvements that we're talking about uh, might require some investment, perhaps, uh, from a interstate or, or other highway perspective. Tell us what some of those possibilities might be. Yeah, uh, you know, these rail improvements are, are really important improvements along the corridor, and they're going to need some potentially some highway improvements or other improvements like pedestrian facilities and things like that to accompany them to help people get to and from, you know, bus stations and rail stations and then, you know, rail transfer stations. So I, I can definitely see a, a situation where, you know, highway improvements, not not just, you know, cars and trucks, but also people too, you know, get, getting them to these facilities. One of the things that's often overlooked or, or forgotten about is, you know, you, you have a bus station, you know, how do you get people to it? How do you provide parking? How, you know, so we want to provide that safe and reliable, you know, transportation facility, you know, from the highway system to the rail system or to the bus station so that we can, you know, quite honestly, keep people moving efficiently. And Jennifer, that reminds me, you mentioned the construction of a new station in the Christiansburg area. All of these kinds of things have to be taken into account when you consider location and access and, and, and the planning for this, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we are uh, looking at a few different locations. As I mentioned before, we acquired a line called the Virginian Line from uh, Norfolk Southern for this. That would provide us with a station location near Merrimack, which is between Blacksburg and Christiansburg. Uh, however, we are looking at potential alternatives, including a station location near the Christiansburg Mall. Uh, that would require us to build some additional track to connect back to the Virginian line, but it would also provide that critical first mile, last mile access and parking access that Dave mentioned too. It would have some improved roadway access. So we're in the process of studying that, working with VDOT on that study as well. And we hope within the next six months, we'll identify our preferred station location. Now, we've talked quite a bit uh, about uh, you know, taking some of the traffic, whether it's passenger traffic or freight traffic, off of the roadways and getting more onto the rails. But these enhancements are about more. It's, it's also improving access and equity. I mean, how so? Yeah, definitely in improving equity because not everybody has a car and uh, people do need options and other, other multimodal options. That's why our Virginia Breeze service is so popular as well. It does connect rural communities to places where people want to go. It provides access to more underserved communities across the state as well, which is important for equity. It provides better access to medical facilities, educational opportunities, better options for healthy food even in certain communities. So we recognize that all of these all multimodal improvements are important to improving equity across the state. 
So in addition to the inner city rail and inner city bus services we're providing across the state, we're currently working on a very important study to look at um, policies and funding for transit across the Commonwealth. It's called our Transit Equity and Modernization Study. We expect it to shed some light on the various needs for transit across the state and develop a set of recommendations that will include improved technology, improve access to infrastructure like bus stops, technology that can help improve payment options as well, and also provide more first mile, last mile service to important commuter and rail services such as Metro or VRE across the state. We expect to have a first draft of that in December and a final draft of that in June of 2022. Jennifer Mitchell, DRPT Director and Dave Covington, I-81 Program Delivery Director. I thank you both for, for being here today and for sharing your insights. We are definitely looking forward to seeing some more of these multimodal improvements along the Interstate 81 corridor. They're a, a vital part of our transportation network, not just on 81, but uh, Commonwealth-wide. So thank you uh, also to our listeners for joining us for this edition of the Improve 81 podcast. Wish you safe travels. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, thank you, Ken.